A federal appeals court ruled Monday that the House of Representatives does not have the authority to enforce subpoenas in court. The D.C. Circuit judges said if the House wanted to, Congress would have to pass a law allowing them to do so. This is the second time an appeals court has thrown out a House lawsuit over subpoenas for former White House counsel Don McGahn. House Democrats want to question McGahn about alleged ties between the Trump campaign and Russia. For more analysis, let's bring in CBSN legal contributor Keir Dougal. Hi there, Keir. So how might this ruling impact the House's ability to obtain information in the future? What precedent does this set? Well, I don't believe this is going to be the last word on this question. And I've read headlines uh, saying to the effect that the House's authority is now gutted. Um, I don't agree with, with that overall conclusion. Um, just for instance, the House could hold Don McGahn in contempt and arrest him and hold him in jail until he decides to give testimony. Um, the, the House and uh, the Senate both have a number of tools at their disposal they can use without going to the courts to enforce subpoenas. They can refuse to pass any legislation. They can refuse to pass a budget. The Senate, if it's a Senate subpoena, can refuse to confirm appointees. The House um, uh, can impeach. The Senate can convict. Um, there are a number of tools that uh, both houses of Congress can use without ever having to go to court. So this, uh, this doesn't mean that uh, House or Senate subpoenas are, are irrelevant now. Hmm. All right. Well, it's important uh, to have your analysis on that point. Well, we know D.C. Circuit Judge Judith Rogers opposed the ruling. What did she say in her dissent? So um, effectively, Elaine, uh, the panel, the majority, the two judges on the majority said that the current statutes on the books are inadequate to provide the House with a viable legal claim. The um, dissenting judge said, no, no, the statutes that are on the books are, in fact, um, uh, perfectly uh, acceptable and, and would, in fact, do the job. The uh, main uh, uh, majority portion of the court said that, well, even though those statutes they claim are not uh, sufficient, Congress could pass a new statute that would give them a cause of action. I, I, this, this panel, this three-judge panel, was previously reversed on a separate but related question in the McGahn case by the full uh, appellate court in Washington, the D.C. Circuit Court. Um, Nancy Pelosi has vowed to appeal. Um, so this decision, the one that we was handed down yesterday, could again be appealed to that full panel, or it could go to the Supreme Court. And as I said, I do not believe uh, that this panel opinion that was handed down yesterday is going to be the final word on this. Well, Kira, a moment ago you talked about some other avenues the House could pursue, members of Congress could pursue to enforce subpoenas, including even going so far as to arrest someone for not complying with the subpoena. What about executive privilege, though? Can you just talk about the role that that would or would not play in a situation like that? Sure. So the um the uh, executive, the Supreme Court has recognized that the executive branch can assert executive privilege. So let's say Don McGahn was, was held in jail. This would cause the public to focus like a laser on, the, uh, on, on his being held and on what information the president um, was directing him to withhold. What was, what was he hiding? I think that would very likely cause the um, two branches to negotiate with a renewed reasonableness, one that we have not seen um, recently, in particular with the Trump administration as asserting across the board executive privilege and effectively stonewalling every subpoena. Um, I, I think that um, if it was employed, you know, with discretion, obviously reserved for an extreme case, uh, arresting a, a, an executive branch official, something which used to happen, or at least used to happen um, enough so that the cases reached the Supreme Court. The last time was in the early 1900s. Um, but this is, this is not something that's new or novel. Um, but I, I think what would happen is uh, the, the branches would come together and likely negotiate in a way that they, uh, that, that they have been unable to under the current stonewalling.
you know, the prospect of something like that happening, I know you say it, it's not new or novel, but it feels like it would be a seismic reaction if that, in fact, were to happen. But you talked a little bit about this a moment ago. How were subpoenas actually enforced in the past, and why is this case so different? So uh, it's only basically been uh, in the 1970s that uh, the, the Congress has really gone to court with any, with any uh, regularity. Um, and that likely stems from a much broader assertion of executive privilege beginning in the Eisenhower administration. Prior to that, um, executive privilege was what was not asserted the way that it, it has been in the modern presidency. Um, and prior to that, the, the branches negotiated, and and they would, uh, you know, they would, there would be a give and take, and uh, and the and the information disputes would get resolved. So uh, starting in about the, the mid 1970s, um, the the House has gone to the courts uh, as an alternative uh, on occasion, and so that's sort of the new historical. Um, the new sort of his history that we're seeing, but the the power to arrest was employed by the House. The, these other these other powers, the power of the purse, the power to refuse legislation, to dismantle executive agencies where uh, where an executive agency was being truculent. Those were widely empo employed by the Congress in the 1800s and the early 1900s. So although it would feel new to us uh, in the history of the Republic, this is not new. Hmm. I want to ask you about another case before I let you go, Kier. As part of a different case, a federal appeals court blocked, at least for now, a New York prosecutor Tuesday from obtaining President Trump's financial records. How might Tuesday's ruling impact the Manhattan District Attorney's investigation into the president? Right. So the immediate impact is a delay. So the Second Circuit, which is reviewing this uh, the, the subpoena now, on the second time that it's uh, ascending through the federal courts, has said that the documents will not be produced until the court has had an opportunity to, to, to review the merits of the appeal. Um, this uh, makes sense to me, given the Supreme Court's instruction um, in July that the uh, subpoena to a sitting president for personal papers should be very, very carefully reviewed on appeal. And so the, the Second Circuit is um, requiring that everything re remain as it is while they, while they have an opportunity to review the president's arguments and review the Manhattan District Attorney's arguments. Um, the the um, Second Circuit may very well order that the, that the subpoena be complied with and the documents be produced to the grand jury. Uh, President Trump might take an appeal again to the Supreme Court, but the immediate effect is of uh, delay while this while the appellate court considers and rules on the appeal. Right. Meantime, here we are now, September. The election really is just around the corner. All right, Keir Dougal, always great to have your analysis. Thank you so much, Keir. Thank you, Elaine.